This is how our reading began in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. Beloved, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. So that's the, the first verse and the, and the first part of the second verse. If, if you've been with us for this last month, a lot of the phrases here, a lot of what I just read, should sound very familiar to you. The Apostle John, uh, as one of my favorite singer-songwriters 20 years ago said, uh, when reflecting on this verse, he wants one thing. He wants one thing above all else in this letter, and so it, should, it, it would make sense that he would repeat himself quite a bit. He wants love. He wants love to be at the center, or else he wants love to rule us, to rule us over and over again. Now, some of you are like me. You have a hard time sitting still with one thing. I, I know that that probably divides the room here. Some of us are very focused people. Um, I am not a classical musician. I am a jazz musician, or at least this is what I use uh, to justify my scatterbrained going from one thing to the next. I can't st sit still for a little bit. Um, it really is just a fancy way for saying that I'm undisciplined. Maybe, maybe I don't know. I, I'm right-brained. Uh, some of my favorite people in the world, though, can preach a book of the Bible for like a hundred weeks in a row, no lie, like years in a row in the same book of the Bible, and that sounds like purgatory or hell to me. That sounds terrible. I, I can't sit still, so I just want to acknowledge that next week is the end. Next week is the end. We're not quite to the end yet, um, so stay with me. Stay with me even as I am trying to um, stay in the text and not want to rush on to the next thing. This morning we come, finally, in so many ways, we come to the heart of this letter, the very, the very heart of this letter, and even perhaps the foundational idea or text of the entire Bible. Many, many will argue that this is the center of all reality, what we've just heard read in our New Testament lesson. It's pretty easy to argue that our New Testament reading is, at the very least, the center of Western thought for the last 1,500 years, okay? Now, I can't argue that completely. Um, how, how, could, how could I say that in one sentence? Well, the father of Western thought, the person who transitioned us from Rome into uh, Christendom or else the, the Western Christian empire was St. Augustine, and he considered 1 John chapter 4, and specifically our reading verse 7 through 21, to be the very center, the epicenter of not only his theology, but of revelation itself. In other words, Augustine would say in many different ways that love is the key to everything. Defining carefully what love is, if we get that right, then we can understand everything, everything. He said it more technically in his book, uh, The City of God, like this, two cities, and you can imagine two marriages or two churches or two households or two different kinds of relationships. There are two cities that have been formed by two loves. Here's the first one. The earthly by the love of self, even to the contempt of God. The heavenly by the love of God, even to the contempt of self. So it's very... It's very black and white. This should remind us of a lot of John's black and white, light and dark emphasis. And so this is perhaps the center of Augustine's uh, his methodology, and it is the, the center of what most of our Western world, most of our imaginations is founded upon, which is to say, how do we love well? How do we love our neighbor well? This is a distinctly Christian Thought. Now, a little closer to my heart. I'm trying to get a little less abstract, a little less historical, and a little closer to home uh, in this series in particular. But close to my heart, the very first words of my favorite book, which I've quoted many times over the last month, by my favorite theologian, C.S. Lewis, he begins literally by quoting 
this text, and he ends by reflecting on this text. So the introduction to the four loves, as well as the final chapter, the entire final chapter, is reflecting on this idea. So this is at the very beginning of C.S. Lewis's The Four Loves. He quotes our text, God is love says St. John. When I first tried to write this book, I thought that his maxim, or else that God is love, would provide me with a very plain high road through the whole subject. If I could just get this one idea right, then it would, it would help me to explain all love. This is what he began with. I thought I should be able to say that human loves deserve to be called loves at all, just in so far as they resemble that love which is God. And he goes on to reflect in so many different ways why this is not exactly what he was going to do in this book, but this is what he set out to do. And we're going to come back to Lewis's final reflections at the end of this sermon, but he, he meditates over and over again on this idea of what the nature of love is, and specifically from 1 John chapter 4. God is love. God is love is said twice in this text and in no other place. And if you think back to chapter 1 from four, three weeks ago, uh, chapter 1, he says another phrase that's similar and they're mutually interpreted, that God is light. God is light. God is love. God is not only, though, he's not only the source of love in this text, he's not just the, the, the thing by which love comes from, he is himself love. God is love. It's, in other words, to use technical language, it's essential to his being. It's not something he does, it's something that he is. God is love. Now, let me use an example to try to explain a complex thought here. What does it mean to be essential or non-essential character of God? So nearly every Sunday we hear John 3.16 read over us, and we'll hear it in just a little bit. You guys know this, or if you don't, here it is. It begins like this, for God so loved, right? God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave. So the first verb, the first action in that verse, this very important verse, is that God did what? He, he loved. God loved. We can put this alongside other, other statements in the Bible, like God creates, or else God rules. Uh, these are things that God does, or to use more technical language, they're his activities. They're something he does. They're not, they're not essential to him. They're outside of himself. So according to John, God's love isn't simply, it's not an activity. It's not one activity among many activities that he does, like creating. It's not, more, it's not one more thing that he does. Love is essential to God's being, or as C.H. Dodd says it like this, all God's activity, pay attention to this, this is really important, all his activity is loving activity. Okay, so Love is not merely something that he does. Yes, God loves us. He loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son. But it's not just something that he does. Everything that he does is loving because love is essential to himself. And so Dodd goes on to say, if God creates, he creates in love. He lovingly creates. If he rules, he rules in love. If he judges, you guys get the point, he judges in love. So he cannot do anything apart from love because it's essential. So you guys are masterful theologians. You can, you can describe a lot of famous theologians' work, C.S. Lewis, Lewis or else uh, St. Augustine. God's love is essential to his being. This is at the heart of John's letter. And so we're going to reflect upon God's love for just a little bit. And then we're going we're gonna to translate that to our love at the end of this sermon. We're going to translate that a little bit more. Now, let me say just for a second, and I'm not going to unpack this fully. I might do this in the parish notes next week, but this would require a lot, a lot of nuance and a lot of things that we need to say. But let me just say this 
because we're here and we need to hear this. Uh, the opposite is not true, okay? The opposite is not true. God is love, but love isn't God, okay? So it doesn't go both ways. God is love. Love is not God. In other words, love proceeds from God because he is love. He is the source of and the progenitor of all love, but not everything that we call love is love. So it doesn't go both ways. Love gets a bad rap, in other words. So if we look to God completely to define love, which is what we're going to try to do here for a few minutes this morning from 1 John's letter, then we could say maybe that everything that is love defines God, right? We could do that, but we don't do that, do we? Right? We, we call a lot of things that are not really love, love. And so uh, we say that God is love, not that love is God. So look with me at God's love in verse 7. So we're going to see brackets at the beginning and end of our text. John begins in verse 7 of chapter 4 with a lot of familiar words. Again, he repeats, knowing God. Do you know God? He who knows God or else Whoever has been born of God. This goes all the way back to our very first Sunday in this letter. And, and then he comes with a familiar exhortation. This is where we've been dwelling for quite a while. Uh, a lot of strong exhortations. Exhortations to love, ultimately, he says. Loved ones, in verse 7, loved ones love one another. If you are a loved one, beloved love one another. This exhortation is repeated in a different way in verse 21 at the end. Whoever loves God must also love his brother or sister. Again, this is very familiar black and white exhortational language. It's darkness and light. There's no, there's no intermingling here. It's love or hate. Christians must be lovers. Christmas, Christians have to be lovers you cannot say that you know God or that you love God or that you have born of God unless you love, unless you're a lover, unless you're a loved one. Notice again, though, that for John, the context for this test of love is among the beloved. It's not, it's not primarily uh, a question of loving our enemy at this point. It's a test of loving among our brothers and sisters or else our neighbors, those who are closest to us, those who are near us inside the household of God. So the hardest place, and here's the test, the hardest place to maintain love is in all of our day-to-day, face-to-face interactions with each other. So he repeats what we looked at last week in the intimate spaces like a home or a work or a church. So our text is grounded in the same or else this a similar exhortation as what we looked at last week. This exhortation to examine yourself, to examine yourself, am I living in love towards my neighbor? We must love, John says, because love is from God. And if you're like me, and I have to restate this over and over again, the intensity of this letter the back-to-back black and white exhortations over and over again. We saw last week in chapter 3 that it leads me often to a place where my heart condemns me. I, I don't walk in love often. And so I hear this black and white language and I think maybe I'm not in, maybe I'm out, but God is greater than your heart. Remember this, remember this, even as we hear this exhortation afresh this morning, he's greater than my emotional ups and downs, my instability of emotions. God is greater than my heart. We can even be obedient children and have a confident heart. So we don't not just have to be up and down with our emotions, but God can lead us into obedience and give us confidence more and more. And so John is going to unpack how. How do we do that a little bit more in our text? In between the bookends of verse 7 and verse 21, with this exhortation to love as he loved us, John repeats a phrase 
four times, four times he, rep he repeats the phrase, in this. In other words, this is how. This is how you, Christian, can love as he loved you. Okay, four, four different grounding statements on how to do this. Verse 9, the first one, the God who is himself love was made manifest in this, in this. He sent his only begotten son into the world to beget us. So the one begotten son now begets sons and daughters to God, and this is eternal life. So this is the first in this. The second one in verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. He is love, and he is the source of all love, and he sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice, or else the propitiation for our sins. So this is another exposition of how, how, keep this in mind, in this, in this, a third in this, in verse 13, in this we know, in this we know, this is how we know that both we abide in him and he abides in us. It goes both ways. How do we know this? He gave us his spirit. How do you know if you have his spirit, the spirit himself testifies to us and in us, to us and in us, if we acknowledge our sins at all, it is because God the spirit speaks to us. And so if your heart condemns you, if your heart condemns you and you recognize your sin, the spirit speaks in us. The spirit proclaims. John says, the good news that we are in the Son, he in us and we in him, and that the Father loves us, and because of Jesus, he atones for our sins. He forgives us. This is how we know in this. And fourth and finally, verse 17, in this, in this love is complete. In this, love is made whole with us. It is perfected with us. Because he loved, we love. And as we love, we have confidence. As our love becomes more complete or complete or perfect, we stop being afraid, John says. We stop being afraid with us with the loved ones, or else with the beloved, walking in love, face to face, forgiving sins, acknowledging sins in the light, over and over again, we stop constantly worrying and bringing, we, we stop constantly worrying about bringing our sins into the light, because we're stopped, we're stopped living in a state of punishment and condemnation and shame all the time, but because of his love, we begin to bring it into the light, and forgiveness begins to rule. Love becomes complete. In other words, love persuades our heart. It speaks to us over and over again in the giving and receiving of forgiveness, in the remembrance that the Spirit is testifying, even as we forgive and are forgiven over and over again, and this is love. So let me restate this. God is the source of all love, and downstream from his love, we love. He's the source of our loving. If we stand, if any of us stands at all, it is the ground. His love is the ground we stand upon. So any obedience is from him. He is the source. Those who have been begotten of the loving begetter God they will love because he first loved us. You know, so this should be confidence inspiring in us. Constantine, Constantine Campbell says it like this, love is the family likeness. It's the family likeness. It's, it's the kind of people that we are. God's sacrificial, sin-crushing, 
wrath-satisfying love is the source, it's the foundation, it's the energy for our loving. He began that good work, and he is enacting it in us. If we have anything at all in our friendships or else in our home or in this church, we must be a place or else a family or a people where anyone, anyone can not only know God's love, But increasingly, in the midst of this place, anyone can feel and experience God's love with us. This is confirming, this is confidence giving, and with one another. We must be those who love by taking our sins seriously. By taking our sins together, all together to the cross. The blood of Jesus will cleanse our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of our sins. It's hard. This is the hard hard place of perfecting love or else completing love in intimate community. But this is what God and Christ has come to do because God is love. We We cannot live outside of love and be in God because He is Himself Love. The Apostle Paul says it like this. Love does not insist on its own way. It doesn't insist on its own way. Love is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing or else sin, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. So this is God's love. This is God's love. God's love is manifest upon the cross. It's manifest upon the image that I put before us last week of God taking upon himself our shame upon the cross and our sin. He was stripped naked so that we don't have to be ashamed in nakedness anymore. Love is not trite. It's not easy. Christ bore our sin and our shame, therefore you don't have to be ashamed. Love is not a feeling. God's love is greater than our feelings. His love persuades our hearts to to stop hiding in shame and hiding in condemnation because of my up and down feelings all the time. This is where we live outside of the city of God in love of self. And we're invited to come in and not be ashamed, to be cleansed by his blood. We must be faithful and righteous to forgive and forgive and forgive again. This is love. Another way to describe everything that I have just been articulating from 1 John chapter 4 about God's love. What is God's love? You could call it, if you've been to, if you've been to church for a little while, you guys probably know the answer, right? That's God's Agape love? Come on, come on. Uh, or if you listen to the old C.S. Lewis uh, uh, audio book of the four loves, which is the only professional recording we have of C.S. Lewis, he says agape, agape. I, don't, I can't do it very well, but Sam will do an imp- impersonation later for you. He's really good at uh, other accents. There's the word, there's the words, yeah. So ask C.S. Lewis over there, agape love Another way to say this in the history of the church, and you might see this in some writings, is charity. This is God's love. It is sacrificial. It's costly. It's not trite, but it's intimate, and it is healing, and it's face to face. So this is what C.S. Lewis, that love, in the center of his imagination, charity, Lewis began the four loves with this perfect love in his mind. This is the book he set out to compare all other loves to. God's perfect love and all of our imperfect loves. In other words, Lewis called this gift love. It is always giving. It's always self-giving. It never has anything. It has no need. It is always given. This is charity. This was in the middle of his imagination the glory of our merciful and our crucified 
king high and lifted up in his love. This is what he set out to compare all other loves to. Lewis says, when I first tried to write this book, I thought that God is love would provide me with a very plain high road through the whole subject. And he quickly came to find out that it can't. I think this is what many of us have come to find out over the last four weeks and maybe even more this Sunday that God's gift love, if this is the only love that we are called into, is a burden, is a standard that we cannot bear, that we always don't measure up to, and it leads us in a place not of peace, but of condemnation of self-recrimination over and over again now lewis didn't abandon this thought altogether he begins and ends this book with a reflection on charity every love every love whether love for our pets or love for our country or our family or our friends or a spouse every love must become like charity In other words, it must become godly. It must become self-giving, completely self-giving. God-like is the language that Lewis uses. We need to become like him. We need to die to ourself, the Apostle Paul says. Every day, dying to ourself, laying down our lives for the beloved. This is what we heard in John chapter 15 in our gospel reading. This boundless love that does not grow weary and given in giving, this is what we're called into. So Lewis doesn't abandon this. God's love is perfect and complete gift love. He doesn't abandon this, but he gives us a way to meditate upon the love of God manifest in our lives. Lewis says this, In God, there is no hunger. There is no hunger that needs to be filled, only plenteousness that desires to give, The doctrine that God was under no necessity to create is not a piece of dry scholastic speculation. So Lewis says that we must hold God's charity, his agape, his gift love high above us. It must rule and reign over our imaginations because God is perfectly and entirely giving. We need to hold this in our head. God is light. God is love. He is the source. He lacks nothing. And even more than lacking nothing, his love is so full that it overflows. In his light, there is no darkness at all. This is all what John has been saying over and over again. He abounds in love. Therefore, we should abound in love. He abounds in love. Therefore, he can bear all things. And so we can begin to bear one another up in love his love is plenteous it's full therefore he can endure all things and in his love we can begin to endure more and more on behalf of others even taking up our own cross and following after him this is the exhortation this is high in lewis's mind lewis follows first john chapter 4 we love we love Because he first loved us. This is a high call. We can't begin with our love or our feelings or any kind of humanistic mysticism, Lewis says. We must begin with God. And because of God's boundless love, every one of our loves can become like his love. We can love as he loved. They can become gift loves. They they can become charity in our lives. More giving and less getting in all of our relationships. More payment and less receipt. More patience and less anger. More forgiveness and less counting of wrongs. More and more our loves can bear resemblance to his love. This is our family likeness. This is what we're born into. We're born again into this inheritance. That is the book that C.S. Lewis set out to write, but that's not the book that he wrote in the end. Why? Why? And I, and I hope to give this to your imagination. And I think this is the center of all the grounding statements at the center of our text. In this, in this, in this. We were made, 
We were made to be image bearers of God and to reflect his boundless gift love in our life. So everything that I've said to this point, I want you to see that as this high call in Christ for your life. We're called to bear his image, to reflect his light into the darkness, to reflect his love into all of our life and our loves, but we are not boundless. This is what changed Lewis's entire book at the very writing, at the end of his life. We were made, as we saw last week, vulnerable. We're creatures. We are not the source. We are always and everywhere dependent, and this is especially true in a fallen and broken world. In other words, as John says over and over again this letter, God wants us to approach him as a little child. And don't you guys know that little children are born in many ways into the city of this world and not into the city of God. They are selfish, and I am just like them. I am a childish, selfish child over and over again. But he invites us to come with no obedience, with no reflected glory, with nothing at all, but come with open-handed hands like a children, like children. Lewis reflects in this way, every Christian would agree that a man's spiritual health is exactly proportional to his love for God. But man's love for God, from the very nature of the case, must always be very largely and must often be entirely a need love. So this is distinguishing from the gift love, love that is from God, that is always giving over and over again, and this kind of love that an infant child brings to their mother. They need. They need this connection with their mother. They need life. They have nothing without this. It is, Lewis says, apparent in our growing up. Awareness that our whole being, by its very nature, is one vast need. Incomplete, preparatory, empty, yet cluttered, crying out for him who can untie things that are now knotted together and tie up things that are still dangling loose. Man, Lewis says, hear this, this is so important. Man approaches God most nearly when he is in one sense least like God. So God in Christ and in this letter and in this sermon thus far has been calling us to image him to be near to him, to be close to him, to grow up into maturity in our gift love. But man, Lewis says, approaches God most nearly when he is in one sense at the other, other end of the spectrum, when they have nothing to give. For what can be more unlike than fullness and need, sovereignty and humility, righteousness and penitence, limitless power, and to cry for help. So here at the center of this letter, and, I, and I'm more and more convinced that if we're going to build any house, whether a nation or a church or a marriage or a friendship or a business, we have to build it upon this foundation, humility. We cannot approach God based upon our resemblance of his love, based upon our in other words, our performance, how well we give and give without wanting something in return. So hear this, hear this, little children. The way to approach God is very nearly the opposite of everything that we have said and heard high above us in this letter, because we are empty and we're called to come with emptiness. He is fullness, we are empty. He is sovereign. We are humble. He is in control. We are helpless. The beginning of love for the Christian is a cry for help. It's a cry for help. Nothing, nothing in my hand I bring. This is so unlike God's love, but this is where we must begin. Like a child who has nothing 
without their parent open hands, cannot approach God's love by performance, but only through humility. And He promises in that place to fill you. He will make us in that place lovers. He will empower you if we come with humility, with open hands, because He has not left us alone. He must love you. This is the heart of the gospel. He must love you, and only then, with nothing in your hands, not based upon performance, can love begin to grow up into fullness. This is, this is the beginning of all love for the Christian. In this is love. Not that we have loved God. Not even that we have reflected His love back to Him or out into the world. Not even this, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us, His enemies. And He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Loved ones, if God so loved us, freely giving all things, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another, if we enter with humility, if we consider highly everyone else around us, more highly than ourselves, if we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected. It is made complete in us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.